I just love being in the studio now and love that process of, of creation, even though it's like, it gets the heart racing and I, I'll start to sweat if I can't, you know, figure something out. But that achievement of making breakthroughs in the studio is like everything to me. I love it. Well, I'm Adam, by the way, and this is Hi, about Adam. you and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. I am in Lavernia, Texas. Okay. Asking about my location. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or were you being more metaphorical? Where am I in the journey? <laughs> uh, both. I mean, I actually want to know exactly where you are. No, you're, currently you're in Texas, but you're originally from Texas, aren't you? Yes, San Antonio, originally. Okay. Lavernia is southeast of San Antonio, so very close by, but more of a rural country feel. And my family's had property out here all of my life. And when pandemic hit, it was just time to be close to nature and and take down the pace of, of my life. And this was the perfect place to be. So I've, I've been here ever since. It's a good home base. I do a bit of traveling quite a bit of traveling, but I, I'm coming back home to Lavernia more and more and it feels really nice. So I think I'm, I'm accepting that this is home and I didn't expect for rural Texas to be home to me <laughs> <laughs> sure. ever. So, but it's, it's a surprise and it's actually really, really quite wonderful. That is, did I read that you, uh, you have a family run cemetery? Is that where you're living? Yes. I, I live on Cemetery Lane, and actually, really? my father my father named the lane probably thirty years ago. We have an easement that goes right to the cemetery, and and he called it Cemetery Lane. And there's a beautiful natural burial cemetery on my property, and uh, we're a public cemetery. And the whole deal is that we just turn we just return bodies exactly how they came <laughs> into the into the earth. So that's no embalming and no uh, materials that won't biodegrade naturally go into um, the coffin. And generally we love to just bury someone with an organic cotton shroud. <clears throat> oh, interesting. So, so, so <laughs> wow. Wait, do, do all of the, then do the coffins you use, are those all biodegradable then as well? Absolutely. Oh, with wow. Bamboo or, or wood. But even, even better for us is for the body to be in a shroud and mm -hmm. go directly into the ground that way. So it's really um, a much faster process of decomposition. And it's really just this lovely thing that when people understand that it's available, that it's an option, they just light up because it feels really right. It feels really um, resonating with our just natural state like the idea of going back in the earth and being planted you being the plant <laughs> next to a tree or having a lavender bush or some kind of herb or wildflowers on top of you and you becoming part of the the ecosystem as your last gesture rather than what's happening with contemporary burial which is not good for the earth and really not good for our spirits either and i could talk about this all day <laughs> it's a really beautiful thing that that came into my life it was my father's um project to have this natural burial cemetery and i just really didn't get it uh at the time this was many years ago and he was our first natural burial <laughs> and was he was he the oh my gosh okay sorry go ahead I'm, I've, yeah, I've I, a lot of, I have loads of questions here I it's it's really it's it's such a lovely thing and I, I did but you know my daddy always said hey I want this natural burial to be our legacy and I was like but dad I'm working on this whole music thing right now and you know I just didn't get it until I got it, until I got how special and magical it is to be able to offer people this uh, return to earth in the most simple and natural way. And it's also important to me to be a very affordable cemetery mm -hmm. and the place to be a sanctuary and, and the kind of location you'd wanna just be there to explore because it feels really good and it's beautiful. And not just that it's a cemetery, but that you might choose to go to this place for a picnic or a celebration of some kind. So there's a lot of intentional energy around making the space itself really inviting 
mm-hmm. and celebratory as opposed to like heavy and and you know dark and like like that so yeah that's, when my, did, side, that's my side hustle no well yeah when did your when did your father start the cemetery was that when you were much older or uh was it something that you kind of grew up with it was actually, he always had a cemetery really throughout my life. It was originally an historical cemetery. So we had some graves that were buried on the property that my father bought. And he had the city come in and deem it an historical cemetery because the graves were over a hundred years old. Okay. So initially it was just a cemetery and he incorporated it so that he could donate plots and then take deductions from his income tax because he was very crafty like that. Mm. But then later, he had the epiphany that he wanted this to be a natural burial cemetery. And it was very important to him that it be affordable because really there's no reason for, for plots to be extraordinarily expensive. That's just a part of the modern industry, the, the, the modern uh, cemetery industry. Plots can still be very affordable and it still is a lucrative business. And of course, the cemetery needs to be able to, to take care of itself and, and be maintained. So there is some cost involved, but, but my cemetery is so beautiful and so natural and peaceful. And it's also the absolute most affordable cemetery, maybe anywhere ever <laughs> for what, for what you get for the experience. So this is just this lovely thing that, you know, my father, it evolved for him. And it was really towards the end of his life that it came to him that he really wanted this to be a natural and affordable cemetery. So Mm -hmm. by that time, that was like 2009 or so. And, and so since then, it's been a bit of a slow burn for me to really embrace it. And honestly, at pandemic, when I moved back here, my mother lives here as well, that we really decided to put heart and soul, my mother especially, she's like the angel that handles people that are in their, you know, really tender moments of-, of Right. Like, I can't imagine having that gig. Like, yeah, it takes a special person. She's made for it. She's, she's like made of compassion, patience, and love. Uh, and we have even a therapy, miniature horse who we can bring out that's amazing (laughs) macaroni is like emergency um emergency call if it's if it's getting a little hairy macaroni can come in and smooth everything out (laughs) the the, the horse's name is macaroni (laughs) that's a great name (laughs) yeah he's he's a precious pumpkin we've got another miniature horse named vanessa She's not as as viable as a therapy pony. You kind of need some therapy after being with Vanessa. She's a little high strung, but <laughs> <laughs> they're a good team. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Well, yeah. uh, so I will did I read that your dad was a he's a he was a dentist, wasn't he? Yes, I actually had two amazing father figures. One was a dentist and also a commercial hot air balloon pilot, which he did on this property, actually right adjacent to the cemetery was where he took off in his hot air balloon every year for 30 years when I was growing up. And he and I participated in some world cups together. In, as a hot air, in, a, in a hot air balloon? <laughs> That's like the most terrifying thing ever for me. I'm not going to lie. Like I'm scared of heights, but I love roller coasters, stuff like that. I know I'm strapped in. I'm good to go. Yeah. I would like, I would jump out of a plane. I would skydive, but there's you, there's no way I would get into a a hot air balloon and actually just sit there and like have to like absorb being that high up in the air. That's fascinating because I am probably the opposite. I haven't had the chance to do uh, skydiving. I haven't been seeking it out for myself, that opportunity. If it fell in my lap, I would probably have to. But yeah. the- I've never done it either, but it's something I'd be interested in. I would do a well over hot would- air balloon. That's fascinating because the balloon is so gentle. It's like you just float up. You just, it's almost like, I mean, you're moving, but unless the wind is really fast, you just feel like you're kind of hovering, but you see this world below. It's a really lovely perspective. It's, it's very calming for me, but I can see, you know, from someone else's point of view that it, it it's like literally giving me anxiety thinking oh, about no, like looking, like- no, no, no. But like overlooking, <laughs> like if I was in the balloon, like looking down, like I can't even imagine, like I would just think I was going to fly out of it. 
Well, like, only if you jump, you would really have to try hard. To I can't even do water. like, I can't even do the Ferris wheels that go like, like <gasps> if I'm like going fast and it's up and then down, like I love it. I'm strapped in, I'm good to go. But like the fact that things like slowly turn, it's like, and then you can just kind of like feel it rocking. Like I, it <laughs> freaks me out. I cannot do it. <laughs> well, I do not suggest that you do that unless you wanted to push yourself out of your comfort zone for what may be lying beyond that, that fear. That's a bit much, I think, for me. Okay. Right <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was maybe that. someday. My father. my father was, uh, you know, he it was a dentist, uh, the third generation dentist, hot air balloonist. He owned a bed and breakfast as I was growing up, and he had this farm. He also did a lot of, he was a uh, he had real estate and he was a landlord. <laughs> was, oh, wow. He was a busy man, but also like president of the Bachelors Club and chairman of the board for the Texas Transportation Museum. Like he was just, he was really full of energy and full of life and loved people. Mm -hmm. And then I had a stepfather who was equally astounding as a person who was a composer, producer, engineer. And he and my mother owned a recording studio as I was growing up. Amazing. So, I mean, full spectrum <laughs> influences on my life, uh, which I'm so great. Every day more, I realize how fortunate I am mm -hmm. to have had the unusual eccentric upbringing that I did. At the time, I was just so embarrassed about everything that my parents <laughs> did. And now I'm just like, oh my God, they were so cool. All of them. Right. So cool. <laughs> Well, with, with that, like having your stepfather and your mom own and operate a studio, like, was that something that you were able to access from a very early age? Like, when do you get into music? Yes. I mean, I, when you own a recording studio or in my case, my parents owned the studio and they were such hard workers. So it was everything I could do to get out of the studio. I was like, can we please go home? We've been at the studio for like okay. 19 hours. <laughs> <laughs> So I really had a, a major flip at a certain point in my life when all I wanted to do was get back into the studio. But by that time, the studio was long gone. Uh, but yeah, I did. I started music at a very young age. With I mean, I was doing, I was a session vocalist by age 11. Because <laughs> like, we were doing Whoa. jingles. Oh, okay. And you needed some kids or, you know, you needed, you know, someone to do the, the squeaky high harmony for, for the, you know, in the jingle. And that was, you know, just part of like, it was in my DNA, like I was around mm -hmm. all the time. So I got really comfortable in the recording studio. Like that's my jam. Like I, I'm one of those people that, you know, in, in some ways you can look at a recording studio and think it's like super sterile and, you know, like, but I, I just, I, I love, I love that. I have really positive associations. Uh, even though I wanted to leave the studio because we were there all the time, I still you know, loved it. I still appreciated what my parents did. And my mother was, you know, leading all the sessions and my stepfather was the composer, producer, engineer. They did a thousand jingles for the San Antonio and that area. Wow. So, and my mom was singing the jingles. So it's, it was, yeah, it was, it was really great. It was a really great foundation. And I, I just love being in the studio now and love that process of, of creation, even though it's like, it gets the heart racing and I, I'll start to sweat if I can't, you know, figure something out. But that achievement of making breakthroughs in the studio is like everything to me. I love it. Mm -hmm. When do you start? Because uh, I, I saw that you what, joined a band out of high school and you you're or maybe that band st started while you were in high school, uh, Eight and a Half Survivor. Uh, eight, yeah. Eight and a half survivors. Eight and a half survivors. What happened to the other half of that? Yeah, story? that's what I was wondering. Right. Uh, but um, you, so was that a band that formed when you were in high school or was that something that started when you moved? Because I saw that you moved to Austin at, at right out of high school. Like, tell me about the. Hmm, yeah. So eight and a half souvenirs was the band I joined after leaving San Antonio, graduating high school and wanting to get to the next level of, you know, artistic endeavor in my life and felt that it was imperative that I leave San Antonio and go an hour and a half north <laughs> to Austin, Texas and see, you know, what frontier was, was going to be discovered there as far as my career aspirations. And I really wanted to be an actor at that point because even okay. though I've seen all my life, the only kind of like 
yes I ever got was for uh, to be in a kung fu film <laughs> oh I didn't see that but that's yeah. and Jet Li was in the movie that's amazing oh, I know it's pretty pretty great uh wild experience and so at that point I kind of thought my yes that I got was was for acting so I was I was pursuing that in that moment and in the course of like looking for a cocktail waitress job, because I thought it would be so romantic to be a struggling actress <laughs> slash cocktail waitress. Doesn't, doesn't that sound great? Mm -hmm. uh, at 18, it did. And, and so I was trying to get a job at this one place and it turned out that the woman who was interviewing me was the wife of the drummer for eight and a half souvenirs. And they were just the biggest thing happening in Austin at the time. Okay. And they were a vocalist. And they'd auditioned a lot of women. And at that time, I think the reason I really got it is because I was just open to the possibility, but had zero expectation or even like, I was just like, yeah, sure. Let's see what happens. Right. You were desperate for it. <laughs> I was not desperate. How, how that worked out, it was just, it was destiny. And I, I got the job and... Yeah, it was a beautiful experience, great education. Really, I call eight and a half souvenirs like my university. It was four years and it was right mm -hmm. after high school. And I was performing with phenomenal musicians, singing in Italian, French, um, and in English, and doing songs like by Cole Porter and Ira Gorshwin and uh, and then Django Reinhardt, you know, like we were doing Paolo Conte, all of this very continental, um, very like the enriching experience of, of, of being in a band. And that was, yeah, that was my education. Very Did you, I mean, you said you were in the band for four years, obviously you, you made it to Austin as in, in that you're, you didn't move to Austin to join eight and a half souvenirs. You moved to Austin, then you lands, you land the gig at, with eight and a half souvenirs. And with that band, like you said, you're in the band for four years. Like, did you guys tour around the country? Like, like, was it like, that was your gig at that point? That was my gig and they were doing great. And they'd had a fan base that they'd cultivated over the, the previous like five or six years. It was such a sweet situation. Like they did all the work, their singer left. <laughs> and I like stepped into something that already had moments. I'm like, trust me, I had no idea how, how fortunate I was. And it was the swing scene. So it was super glamorous and, and everything was, really beautifully laid out for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had to step in and say yes. And I did and had a remarkable experience and traveled all around the country and you know recorded several albums and had this onstage experience that was invaluable uh, because everybody had their stuff together. And I just got to, to be myself and explore who I was on stage and I, I knew I, I was, it was so beautiful because I know, I knew so little. It was really, it was really like a heart, heart focus. Like, oh, wow, this, this music is so fun to dance to. So I had my own little actions and moves and, and I had just full freedom to explore myself as a performer. And in, because it wasn't me as a solo artist, uh, it was a double-edged sword because I felt liberated in that I was kind of playing a part. Uh, at the same time, I was doing music that I likely would not have done had I been really just following my own heart. Mm -hmm. But I was still so young and impressionable that it really kind of, you know, it, it really got into me. And and in a, in a positive way, it was a, a real fun, uplifting, you know, danceable thing. But when the swing sing ended, it was really, and the, and the band dissolved, it was really about figuring out who I was as a musician, songwriter, performer, when I wasn't playing that part. So mm -hmm. that was the, that was the next level of my exploration as an artist. And it was a, you know, a, it's, it's all, it's all a trip. It's all a trip. And the trip doesn't end. It just keeps going and going <laughs> and going. Was it something like when, when the band dissolves, do you stay in Austin or do you move? to LA do you move to and you know stay in Texas like what, what what's the next uh, stop the next stop was LA because I kind of had that thing happen where I was discovered by this uh, manager named Bud Prager who had sold 100 million albums in his career 
and basically gave me the line like he he came to see it and have souvenirs in los angeles we played at this one private private venue called the buffalo club and bud came and you know he was like great i love you we're gonna work together ditch the band and i was like ah never <laughs> and then the band broke up and i was like hey bud <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Can we can we can we see what what's possible? So he was in LA. I was living in Texas, but I went to LA a lot. And it was Bud who really gave me my next level of education. Let's call that like grad school. And it, after having managed um, foreigner, wow, and, UF and these just like massive bands, he had tremendous insight into the industry. And he began basically dismantling all of my illusions. <laughs> it was about, you know, success and, and really telling me, you know, in a more reality-based framework, what was possible. Because at 18, I was signed to a major record label. Like, I thought it was only skyrocketing from there. <laughs> there right, no, right. You know, like, you don't, you have no other perspective. And, and it turns out I still had a lot more to learn. And, and Bud was instrumental in just get, getting me some grounding. And I think ultimately he was trying to help me to find my identity as an artist uh, in the way that he could provide, a, a path that he could provide. And what he eventually came to from his perspective was that I was a very visual artist, a very visual performer. He did not think that I was a great songwriter because his idea of a great song was, feels like the first time. <laughs> right. And, you know, <laughs> urgent. And, and I'm just like, it's not, I, that wasn't where I was coming from. I was, I was like all about, you know, it was a bit, it was a bit more avant. <laughs> than that both my both my preferences personally and what I was writing and all that jazz so so he was like okay we got to find this girl a connection in the, the the television or film world where she can where she can be filmed performing and that's going to kind of be how how he felt uh my best chance for making it because <laughs> he really after having foreigner he wanted to be back on top again like he wanted to feel it breathe it live it i mean he was like on top of the world with that act and even though he had all the money in the world and had experienced all the success he wanted it he wanted it again so he was investing in me to try and figure that out even though he would tell me over and over again not only is it a long shot christabel your chances are sl extremely slim to none but this little window we're gonna we're gonna shoot for it and i'd be like okay okay and he pulled a favor to a favor to a favor and got me 15 minutes in a room with creative artist agent, Brian Laux. And after being with Brian, I don't know, probably like nine, 10 minutes, his time was expensive. <laughs> so yeah. we, we didn't like waste any time. He said, you know what? I, I, think, I think David Lynch is gonna, is gonna be interested in working with you. And wow. Yeah, and that moment, that moment changed everything for me. Uh, but it was even, you know, from, from that to, I mean, it was, you know, just all these little incremental mm -hmm. sparks of, of potential and possibility that became years and years and years of, of you know, uh, tumultuousness and beauty and, and uh, all of the things that go into a, an artist's career. I've had a, a bit of an odd trajectory in some ways, but, I've been super, super blessed. And there's been some interesting <laughs> potholes uh, and then some like, you know, then some soaring like in a hot air balloon <laughs> and then some devastation, but it's all so beautiful. And I, I, I wouldn't change a thing because I'm here with you, Adam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a new record out. And, uh, but before we get it, I'm just curious with, okay, so he, uh, Brian suggests David Lynch. Then yeah. you meet David Lynch, obviously, and you've worked together for a number of years. But how did that first introduction go? Like, uh, were you probably a fan of his prior to to meeting him? And was that like a kind of a surreal situation to be in? Uh, you think a surreal <laughs> situation <laughs> to meet David? Yeah, Lynch? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a given. Um, in whatever capacity, just 
because you already have this association with David. Like if you're if you're a fan of his work, there is this kind of patina even around him, orically of like intrigue and, and mystery. Mm -hmm. And then he ends up filling that out with the rest of who he is, which is warmth and compassion and and wit <laughs> and humor and you're like wow so yes it was surreal um there's all kinds of stories I could go into but I'll I'll just cut to on David on his doorstep and knocking on the door and Bud's there and Brian's there and and everyone's nervous because we just, you know, it's it's just a lot of heightened energy in that moment. And right. David opens the door and just disarms everything. He's got like a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And he just opens his arms. He's like, Christabel. And he just gives me the biggest hug. And I don't think he hugged Brian or, or Bud, <laughs> but, but I think that envelopment and, and in a way that like um, affirmation that he mm -hmm. wanted this meeting to go as beautifully as any of us did because he was looking for someone he was you know he was I guess that was what I figured out much later on is that he was as hopeful as hopeful as I was that this was going to work out because mm -hmm. he he's a creator and and he had all these tracks of music and had been looking for a voice and a person to to create the full vision coming to life so, and I needed tracks <laughs> and I needed a producer at that time. And I was just looking for what Destiny was providing next in my reality. This was after eight and a half souvenirs had dissolved and that David so beautifully stepped into that role was just magnificent. And then the reality of me still being signed to RCA Victor and not even able to make music with him. Mm -hmm. And all of these other things came crashing down. But that day of bliss that we met was just, you know, it couldn't have been any more perfect and lovely. It was, it was just the fairy tale. <laughs> really, it would have been a fairy tale with any producer. That's how beautifully we connected but it was also David. So I, I, I just feel tremendously blessed for that experience. It was, yeah, it was a, a, a cherished memory that first day. Yeah, well, with that, I mean, you said you were assigned to a label and you couldn't really do much, right? Being under contract with them. Like at what point do you, are you able to start actually working with David and putting out songs? Yeah, it was, it was several years later after that because there was this, like excitement and then it was like <sighs> everything just deflated because he at that point really wanted to to get moving because he had the juice flowed and it was time and he knows the importance of like riding that wave and mm -hmm. and it was all just it was all just impossible at that moment so it took a while for that to come around again and, and what happened actually was a couple of years later Brian saw David at a party in Hollywood, some Hollywood party. And David asked about me and he said, you know, does Christabel, does she still have the record label? Is she available now? And Brian said, let me check. So Brian got back in touch with me and I was no longer, thank God, because Bud was able to, because he knew the, the vice president of BMG, he was able to extract me from my contract, which was a miracle. Like so many people didn't have that, luxury like so many just locked into contracts for their careers that they couldn't escape but I was able to get out of my contract because of Bud and then I was um, at that point yeah super available to work with David but I it had to kind of happen on its own like that it's not like you can be like hey David are you ready because honestly right. I didn't know what the vibe was and it's obviously got a because David had the studio, it was his music, it was his production, he was paying for all of it. So he had to be the one to rekindle the flame. <laughs> and, and he did, and, and that was the right time. So I went back and we started working together. But even from then, that was probably a couple of years after our first meeting. And it wouldn't be, for many reasons, it wouldn't be a decade until my solo album, you know, it was actually not, it was Christabel and David Lynch. Mm -hmm. train at 2011 that that was that was the record that we first put out together and then 
we put out another one a few years later. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah. so it took a while. I mean, it sounds like it took a while before it ended up working. I don't know, and then a decade. It's, it's yeah, like, no, obviously, wow. but like, you, but between there, you had, uh, you released or you recorded a couple of solo albums, right? Yeah. So you're doing your own thing before. Doing my own thing. I was a hired gun for a lot of, you know, corporate gigs and bands that had extraordinary situations, bands that were like performing for these just incredible private events. And I was, I was doing well at that time. And, you know, when you are the golden voice for Microsoft and in the center, you know, in Las Vegas and this on a platform, in the center of 8,000 executives, and then, you know, improvising opera with the spotlight on you at eight in the morning, I was like, okay, this is, this is, this is fun. And I even enjoyed it, but I was not emotionally fulfilled at the level I wanted to be. And, and that whole decade was really a finding of myself and exploration and, and then, you know, some relationships <laughs> kind of like I, I I came out I came out of the gate you know at 18 and into this band and like full throttle and then there was this kind of like time you know really a decade that it took to really kind of re recalibrate and refocus and discover myself and be able to step into what was uh, gonna be the next part of my life and so it's like I can look back and be like wow that was a long time but I think it was perfect it was absolutely perfect it was what I needed to be able to embody the music that David and I had written together because it was deep mm -hmm. music was like and to be able to perform it like really really give it what it deserved I needed some more life so I got some more life <laughs> and and then I and then I had my debut album and then a lot of things just really started moving mm -hmm. nice so once you put out, yeah, your debut record comes out, what, 2017? 2011. Oh, 2011, sorry. And then that's yeah. what, with him, and and then you put another record out with him in 2016, and then you went back to a solo album in 2017, correct? Yes. Okay. No. I've been writing the whole decade. I was writing, I mean, I wrote, I don't know, five albums at least. Wow, okay. Ten albums on it. Oh, God, so many so much that I was really, was really going for it, but it was still, you know, there's all these processes that have to happen for an artist, like to put something out in the world there so much, you have to have confidence. You have to have um, self-worth. You have to really feel like what you're doing and creating is, is, is something that the world needs. And, mm -hmm. and I was discovering that within myself. So I was still in practice. I was still dedicating my life to music and there was still life to be um, experienced th so that I could bring all the pieces together and, and be an artist that was mm -hmm. really offering my heart and soul and felt really like uh, <clears throat> grounded in that, not like that I was just kind of trying to hold on to things or bring something together that wasn't that wasn't quite realized. I had to come into myself, and so all of that was was right on time. But it took mm -hmm. some time. Sure. sure. Well, you recently. I mean, you released the record in the beginning. What two months ago now? Yeah. A little roughly over two months. And uh, Midnight Star. Tell me about this this album. <sighs> well. <laughs> it's it's the it's my first foray into all electric sounds like it's all synth like it's mm -hmm. purely synth I think there's one I mean there's a there's a few horns and a few strings but they were first they were synth and then we replaced you know with with some with some real instruments and that created the potential for like just expansion and experimentation. And it was pandemic, although we started it before pandemic, but then there was just like, wow, this liberation. Uh, we didn't have a band that was kind of there and trying to accommodate different things. It was just me and Chris. And we had, you know, been creating our repartee as, as uh, songwriters for, for a decade at that point. And we just like, the goal was to make really, really strong songs, songs that I wanted to sing for the rest of my life, songs that I wanted to embody when I was in front of an audience, which is really kind of like my 
that's that's my ultimate goal is to bring a show and to really like have a connection like a visceral exchange with an audience so to do that you need great songs so we just we just tweaked and tweaked and tweaked until we thought we had the best material and it was in this container of this kind of sci-fi adventure that was happening because you need something to hold it together like you need a cradle let's say for for the creation and you need some kind of containment so that you're just not like in the stratosphere constantly so our container was this kind of sci-fi intergalactic you know uh, sparkle electro pop world that we're like okay why not like there is let's just let go of all limitations all the stuff that I was doing before that was moody and and sexy and dark and like a little heavy and definitely more like you know red wine nighttime moonlight sophistication kind of kind of vibes which I love that's I'm, I'm all about it this needed to be a bit more sparkly and iridescent. And I was really ready for that in my life. I was ready for that as a musician to like, to give it some glitter, but not a a little, it's a little clammy. And it's kind of like, it's like a space cabaret. (laughs) (laughs) And I just had to be willing. I just had to be willing to explore. So it was like my inner exploration became my musical exploration became this, you know, ascension into this other realm of music that felt really good. And the music was really making me happy and making me feel strong and powerful. And the journey of Midnight Star as a character and as an album was reflecting my own personal awakening and ascension. Mm -hmm. So it was all this kind of mystical alignments that were sparkling and and Midnight Star, the album is like the physical and oral representation of of all of it. Mm -hmm. Was this something that kind of came together over the course uh, of the the pandemic? Is that what you said? Or it started after the fact? It started before. Okay. But it started before actually in January, 2019. And then I, no, no, actually, I'm sorry. January of 2020, started in January of 2020. Mm -hmm. And then I like went off to Scotland and did all these things. And in the process of that pandemic happened, but we had our first demos, like six songs before pandemic. And then once pandemic happened, I moved back to Cemetery Lane. We put together a demo studio here and we just started, you know, and that was, and it wasn't, I, I wouldn't call it a pandemic record, definitely there were parts of me because of the stillness my relative stillness during pandemic I was able to do a lot of personal work that was infusing the record Mm -hmm. but it wasn't like some direct response like we gotta do something happy because everything is sad it was like this it was the natural calibration for the experience that he and I were both having but not like you know in in protest it was in harmony, maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, more like that. And it was, you know, definitely a way, super fun to, to, to go into that world and be creating and for Midnight Star to be coming to life in the midst of everything that was going on and to have the time and space to go deep uh, Mm -hmm. because I wasn't touring. Right. Yeah. Or doing (laughs) You yeah, know. you had a lot, you had nothing but time right at that moment. I mean, I I wish that was the case. There were a lot of other things happening in my life at the moment, but the stillness, the not I mean, not trap, not going right not, twice a year. There was mm-hmm. definitely relative stillness definitely. in comparison to the past decade. Yeah, that me. makes total sense. It's an incredible record. I had a chance to listen to it earlier this week. I really, really like it. Um, and thank you so much for being flexible on the time on this and in doing this, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I have one more quick question for you. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. So, you know, it's kind of, maybe it's kind of cliche and mundane, but just keep doing it. (laughs) If you're, if you're, if you don't have a plan B, 
if this is really, you know, who and what you are, I call them lifers. And you know, if you're a lifer, <laughs> if you're a lifer, just keep going, keep doing it, don't give up. And something that I think is very powerful is really visualizing the career that you want and creating goals and just seeing yourself on stage where you wanna play. And really don't be shy about dreaming the life that you want and focusing on it and seeing yourself, visualizing yourself stepping into that life. It's a very, very powerful tool. Plus it makes you happy. It makes you happy to be in that imagination process. And, and it, it, it sparks ideas and everything just can, can have the opportunity to come into harmonious flow when you're in a positive vibration around your career and around who you are and what you want to give to the world. And, and that clarity can really go a long way. And sometimes it takes a long time to get there and that's okay. That's okay, keep going for it. I am living proof. <laughs> Just don't give up. There's, there's such beauty in store. There's such loveliness in, in your potential, in your dedication to music. All my love. <laughs>